Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this message from the Roots Community Church. Our prayer is always that God will use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. And if you're new here, consider subscribing to keep up with all of our great content. Thanks again for checking out this message. We pray it's a blessing to you. So some great uh, guys preached the last few weeks. Um, Bobby, Greg, Jim did a phenomenal job working through uh, some of Romans 6 and Romans 7. And I get the opportunity to jump into Romans 8, which I'm grateful for because they took some hard text I didn't have to preach through. Um, Jim last week had a really difficult text and he did a killer job with it um, uh, of wrestling through the I do what I don't want to do and what I hate to do I end up doing text where, where Paul ske- seems a little bit bipolar or schizophrenic or something. But we can all relate, can't we? Like, what? I, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm no longer that person. The old me is dead and gone, and yet here I am doing dead things. How did this happen? And so that we're reminded that our hope is in Jesus Christ and not in our own strength to be able to abide and, and move forward in the Spirit. So we're going to continue in some of that today. And I hope that through today's message, you will have more assurance of your salvation. Yeah. One person's excited. The rest of you are just here for the day. I'm just <laughs> checking the box. I went to church this morning. God, are we good? <laughs> You'll see that's not how you're good by your church attendance. It's not even by knowing scripture, it's by knowing the God whose word it is. And so um, let me just remind you that we ended part of last week in Romans 7. (laughs) Paul said, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then he says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That in, in... some of our realization of the fact that we still live in a body that is prone to sin, that we need delivered and that we have a deliverer and the deliverer is Jesus Christ. Today, if you're taking notes, write this down for the title, Made Alive by the Spirit to Live by the Spirit. I hope you heard that made alive by the Spirit, to live by the Spirit. We're going to start by just reading through the text in Romans chapter 8. It's 17 verses, so it'll take us just a moment, but bear with me. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live according to the spirit, excuse me, in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. 
But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. It's a long text, but it's powerful. It is so good. And we're going to... Um, just dive right into kind of going verse by verse through this because, because it's a lot. And so if you're taking notes, write down, free from the penalty and power of sin. There better be some amens today because this text is amen worthy. Not because I have anything great to say, but the text is amazing. <clears throat> therefore, therefore, really is looking to all the text before this, not just chapter seven that says we wrestle through this and, and kind of feel crazy because we do the things we don't want to do and the things we want to do we don't end up doing and, and that who, who will deliver us, but it's Christ Jesus. <clears throat> but also looking all the way back and understanding that we are justified, declared righteous because of what Christ Jesus has done on our behalf, not because of our own works or what we have accomplished in fact, Paul laid out for several chapters that in our own strength, we deserve wrath. Yeah. In fact, we've built it up. We've piled it up on top of our own heads. But God has justified us freely through the grace of God, through Jesus Christ, as we have put faith in him. Hmm. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's talking about penalty, debt, judgment. For those who are in Christ Jesus, those who have put their faith in Christ Jesus for salvation, there is now no condemnation. Now, it's already been dealt with Amen. by Christ on the cross. It's not looking forward to no condemnation, although we understand there is no judgment for those that are in Jesus, but that now there's no condemnation. It's already been dealt with. The debt, the penalty has been paid. Okay, you should be more excited about that. The freedom that we have because of what Jesus Christ has done. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Okay, Paul does some interesting things sometimes, and we're going to look at it right now, where Paul will use the same words kind of back to back and mean different things. Hmm. So a while back, we looked at the fact that it says that all of sin fall short of the glory of God. So he's saying all of us have sinned, that all of us have actually had, had sin passed down to us through the line of Adam, all of us. They don't say all are justified freely because of what Christ has done. And both of those alls mean different things. Yeah. That one is everybody and one is all those who are in Christ Jesus. There's an interesting thing here. He's going to use law, the word law in different ways. Here in, in verse 2, he's going to use it as a, a, a power or a principle. But in verse 3, we're going to see in just a moment, he's going to use it as the moral code of God. So you need to understand this because it can be kind of confusing if you go like the law of the spirit, the law of sin and death. And in just a moment, he's going to say that the law was powerless to, to like save you. And you're like, well, what? You just said law three different times. What are you talking about? And we see here that here he's talking about through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit. That's talking about the, the principle of the spirit or the power of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death, the principle of sin and death, or the power of sin and death. Hmm. That here we see in Jesus Christ, there is no longer guilt for us, and there's also no longer bondage. There's freedom. 
the penalty of sin and the power of sin have been dealt with. Not in anything that we could have done, that, that in our own strength we broke that bondage or made ourselves guilt free, but it's freely extended to us by the grace of God that we receive it by faith alone. In Christ alone, we're saved. Yes. If you're taking notes, right? The power to be righteous. The power to be righteous. Righteous in act, but also righteous in standing. There's a righteousness that is a right with God. I'm made righteous. I'm made right with God and right standing with God. But there's also righteous acts. Like if I do something righteous and right, it's, it's a right action before God. Hmm. We need to understand that. In fact, in the, in the title of my message today, Made Alive by the Spirit to Live by the Spirit, you'll also see it's, it's made holy by God to live holy to God, made righteous by God to live righteous before God. The power to be righteous for what the law, this is the moral law, God's commands, <clears throat> was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. Now understand this, the law, Paul's already talked to us about the law is good, but the problem with the law is it has no power to make me righteous. It has no power to make me in right standing with God. It is powerless, and the reason it is powerless is because of our flesh. We have the inability to keep it. If somehow we would have been born without inherent sin and been able to keep every part of the law, then it would seem that it had power. But the law is powerless. You know that. Look at the commands of God and see how well you've done. And you go like, I don't feel righteous at all trying to keep that by myself. It has no ability, no power. It is impotent. It is not able to produce righteousness in you, to save you. Hmm. But what the law was powerless to do, the law is good. It's, it, it, it's God's righteous decree, God's commands of what it means to, to be acting in right order, but it's powerless to save us, powerless to make us righteous, powerless to bring us into right standing with God. In fact, it just exposes how far off we are. It was weakened by the flesh. God did it, though. God did. The law was powerless, but God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. This is cool. You need to understand this. God, for, God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. We'll see later, and maybe you understood it when we read through the text that we're called children of God, all of us that have the spirit of God that indwells us. But you need to understand that we are Children of God, because we've been adopted. Jesus is the one sent by God as the child of God, the son of God, God the son. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. They want to just help us understand that he came as truly God and truly man. God in the flesh. But he did not have the, the, the sin that was passed down through all of us through Adam. Hmm. Like us, but without sin. To be a sin offering. I love in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. It says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Can we go back to the Romans text? To be a sin offering, that, that Jesus was sent knowing that was his job, that was his role. Live the perfect righteous life we cannot and have not lived in our place for us. And then to die the death he did not deserve because he lived the sinless, perfect, righteous life. But to die in my place and in your place for the sins that we have committed. So that there would be an offering for our sin, a, a, an unblemished 
unblemished offering for our sins in our place. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. Now check this out. Just a moment ago we said that there is now no longer condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean that our sins aren't condemned. They've been condemned. There's no longer condemnation for you because Christ took the condemnation of sin on himself. He condemns sin in the flesh. It's been done. Jesus, the cup he drank is the cup of the wrath due sin. He drank it in our place, on our behalf, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. Well, I haven't lived it. I don't think it's too far for me to say that you haven't either. The righteous requirements of the law, we haven't done, but Jesus Christ has, and that he was the sin offering. He took our sin on himself and, wait for it, extended his righteousness to us, gave us his righteousness, that the righteous requirement that was demanded of us to be in right standing with God is given to us in the great exchange. 2 Corinthians 5.21, here it is. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Hmm. Let that settle. The righteous requirement that is necessary has been obtained by us through Christ or for us, not by us, for us, by Christ. Go back to the Romans text. Us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, earlier we saw that it was weakened by the flesh. We don't live according to the flesh. In the flesh, Jim last week when he preached did a great job talking about the flesh, that it's the fallen, egocentric human nature. It's the sin-dominated self. In fact, Jim called it the me, 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 I. The, 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 the inward turned, all about me, worship me, worship my desires, lift me up, bow down to self, and everyone else should too, flesh. God has given us the power to be righteous. He's shown the power for righteousness through Christ and given us the power to live righteous according to his spirit. We are made holy by God to live holy to God. I hope you heard that. Listen, us doing all the the requirements of the law, you can't do it. There's no way. You've tried. You failed. You know it. I've tried. I've failed. I know it. Thank God that that's not the way that I'm saved. That's not the way that you're saved. And understand that now, from a new perspective, a grace-driven effort, my life should reflect the fact that I long to please him. Will I do that perfectly all the time? I can't wait till that day. But (laughs) until then, Romans 7 is still a real part of my life. That that I still am going to do some things that I hate to do. But guess what? Now I hate to do them. No, I'm grieved that it happened, so I long to not do that any longer. It is no longer a part of my regular habitual life. It is no longer a a, a pattern of my regular routine. But I long to please my God that has saved me, that has taken my sin and dealt with my sin, that I am made righteous to walk out righteousness. You can't give me three weeks off. I come back with too much energy. (laughs) Write this down. Your mindset matters. Your mindset matters. Where your mind is set matters. Romans 8, 5 through 8. Those who live according, now hold on a second, live according. Follow the promptings and live under the control of. Those who follow the promptings and live under the control of. 
those who live according to the flesh, that fallen, sinful, self-centered, egocentric self, have their minds set on what the flesh desires. They have a mindset that is on what the flesh desires, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't occasionally have a thought that goes that direction, but where's your mind set? Where is it established? What is it living in accordance with? Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Live according to, right? We just talked about it. Follow the prompting, promptings of and live under the control of what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. Now, there, there's some interesting things going on here. When you read through different commentaries on, on what's going on, um, many believe that what they're actually talking about is the believer and the unbeliever. That what they're saying is that those that have the Spirit in them have their mind set on things of the Spirit. Because now they are regenerated. They are a new person. They're reborn. They're part of a new family. And that it is, is, it is the only way to make sense of your mind being set on the Spirit. Because you can't set your mind on the Spirit if you don't have the Spirit in you. Also, there's an idea of, okay, but what about for the believer that still sometimes sets their mind on these things? Hmm. The believer doesn't live in the realm of the, the flesh. Okay. They live in the realm of the spirit. They sometimes do things in accordance with the flesh. That's when they're sabotaged when they're sidetracked, when they get off, the tra- get off track. But primarily what they're talking about here is what the believer does and what the unbeliever does. Those that live in the flesh and those that live in the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit Desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Amen. We know that the mind governed by the spirit is not only life and peace for the future when, when Christ returns, but there is life and peace and even being governed by the spirit in the here and now. That when I live a righteous life, when I live in step with the spirit, the, I, I have life. It, it leads me into life. It leads me in peace. I am not disheveled. I'm not out of sorts. I am not out of alignment when I am walking in the Spirit because the the Spirit leads me in truth. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. Dang. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Paul is, is, is stating this argument. He's, he's not pretending as if if you have your mind set in the right place, then you'll be saved. Or it, it, He's already done seven chapters worth of work to help us understand that it's not by our own works that we're saved, but because of faith in the grace extended to us in Jesus Christ. But he wants us to understand that the believer is built differently. They're called to live differently. They're a different type of person. They don't live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. They're not governed by a mindset on the flesh and its desires, but they are governed by the spirit and the desires of the spirit. And that those that live according to the flesh are hostile to God and cannot obey his law. I don't know if if maybe you've walked through this before, but but those that have been regenerated, have the spirit of God that dwells inside of them, they might struggle in obeying the law, but their heart is to follow God. There are those, uh, 
There are, there are those that would say, I love Jesus and I, that's who I follow, but that their life is hostile to God's law and they're okay with being hostile to God's word because actually they are following the egocentric self. And so when they're confronted with the truth of God's word, they must decide, who do I really serve? Everybody can pretend that they submit to God's law when they want to follow what is being told. The only way you can tell who really, if, who really is in charge, who really is the priority, is when there is a conflict. So when the word says something, but your flesh says something, that's when you get to see who you actually follow. And I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying on the day-to-day you won't struggle. We, we, we went through chapter 7. But what I'm saying is too often I see believers that when confronted with the word by the spirit will be hostile towards the confrontation, even when it's done in love, because their actual goal is their own feelings and what they want, not following after God. And that should concern us. I I don't know how many times that I've had the unfortunate responsibility, maybe opportunity to sit with those that would say, this is what I'm going to do. And I would have to say, this is what the word says you should do. And they would say, yeah, but this is what I'm going to do. And I would say, my heart hurts. I have concern for you. Because what you're telling me right now isn't that will be hard, but I want to follow God. What you're telling me currently is, I know that God doesn't want that, and I don't care. You're currently being hostile towards the law of God, and that should bring you great concern. Because where you are indwelled by the Spirit, it drives you towards truth and to follow Christ. does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. I don't want God displeased. In Hebrews 11.6, it says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because those who come to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. that you must have faith to please God. It is impossible to live by the flesh, to be consumed by the flesh, to have all of your attention set on. In fact, when we talk about mindset, it's it's to focus intently, it's preoccupied, it's to give all attention to. And so it's that the focus is not God, the focus is self, the focus is flesh, the focus is this world, the focus is everything but God. And in that state, it's impossible to please God. It is, it is hostile towards God. It is in desperate need of an intervention by the Spirit to make a, a hard rock heart turn fleshy. Yeah. <laughs> to have death be turned to life. Hmm. Focus on right things. Listen, I can't get into all of it today, but you, you could read all of Colossians 3. You could read Galatians 5. Um, to, to kind of work through this, but I want you to think through this question. Where's my mind set? Where's my heart set? Where's my treasure at? Right. It reveals who God is in your life. Yes. Look at in Colossians 3, just one through four. You can read the rest on your own. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Listen, trying to help us understand, like you need to be focused on where your life is, where you're at, to understand who you are. Set your mind, set your heart on heavenly things, on Jesus Christ. Philippians 4 and verse 8, talking about what our minds should be consumed with. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. 
that there's a focus, there's a mindset. We need to focus on right things and we need to fight wrong things. If the flesh brings death, I want to fight it. And the only way to fight it is with the spirit. It's not in my own strength. And the spirit brings life and peace. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, fight wrong mindsets. Look at this. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. That's a strong line. Divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Listen, where the law is powerless to save and bring obedience, the spirit is powerful to save and bring obedience. And that we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Random thought comes through, trying to take me towards the flesh, towards the world. It's the devil planting thoughts in my life that I have the the power, the divine power by the Spirit of God to grab that thought and force it into obedience to Christ. Take it captive and go like, hold on a second. That's not true. That's not who I am. That's the old me. That's the dead me. That's dead and gone. That's the flesh. I don't live in the realm of the flesh. I live in the realm of the spirit. I'm not governed by the flesh. I'm governed by the spirit. Your mindset matters. Focus on right things. Fight wrong wrong mindsets. Oh, man, I have a lot of verses still to go through. (laughs) Write this down. You are in the spirit, and the spirit is in you. I love this. It happened several times uh, that we're in God and God is in us, that we're in Christ, Christ is in us, that we're in the Spirit, Spirit's in us. And it's this interesting thing where you kind of get, okay, I'm in God, but God is in me. Anybody else? I'm the only one that does that. Okay, cool. Check this verse out. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh. Now listen for a second. He's talking to believers, and he wants them to understand. You just wrestled through in the text, like, hold on a minute. Uh, Sometimes I feel like I'm in the flesh. Sometimes I'm in the spirit. Uh, You just made it sound like those are like believer and unbeliever. Now I'm kind of wondering, where am I at? Paul wants to bring some assurance. He's like, you, believers, are not in the realm of the flesh. But, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Now listen to this. He says, without the Spirit inside of you, you cannot belong to Christ. Right. And, wait for it, that means if you belong to Christ, the Spirit of God lives in you. And some have wondered and wrestled through, well, I believe in Jesus. I put my faith in Jesus for salvation, but do I have the Spirit of God? Because some have told them you need to wait for some extra thing. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Maybe there, listen, this says if you belong to Christ, his Spirit is in you. In fact, the only way to put your faith in Jesus is to be regenerated. The Holy Spirit does a, a work in you to bring you to life. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. That we have the spirit of God that lives in us. And, and, and go ahead and let that sink in for a second. I think we forget that. Spirit of God? The Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, lives in me lives in you if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, 
I, I want that just to sit for a second. God that created all things with a word. Who has the power over all things, the authority over all things. His power is beyond what you can even grasp. And that he has chosen to dwell in those that dwell in him. It's humbling. It's powerful. I think too often we think too small of that power when fighting the flesh. So the sin that might be whatever our appetite for sin is comes back around and we go like, I always fail at this. I don't think I can fight it. You can't. And you have forgotten who lives in you. And for a moment, you have considered that sin is stronger than the spirit that lives inside of you. I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm yelling at me too. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Now, understand this. He's saying your body's going to die because of sin, but you don't live just in the flesh. You live in the spirit. And because of that, there is life for you. And that he will give life to your mortal body. You have a resurrected body in your future. And we need to understand that when he gives life, he doesn't just give life in the future, he gives life now. Eternal life is about quantity, but it's also about quality. And I don't mean that from like a health and wealth prosperity doctrine. What I'm saying is that why shouldn't we live better? And I don't mean that means like you have a bigger bank account than the person that doesn't love Jesus. What I mean is there is a better way to live. There is a proper way that God lines out for us in the text to follow after him by the Spirit. That we are made alive by the Spirit to walk in the Spirit, to, to, to live by the Spirit. And we are not just sitting around going like, oh, it stinks now, but we have life at the end. But we rejoice. We walk in joy. We still suffer in this broken, sinful world like everybody else. And we rejoice. We have joy. You are in the Spirit, and the Spirit is in you. I love in 1 John 4, 13 through 15, says this. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And that acknowledgement isn't just a head knowledge. It's an understanding of that and putting your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. I feel like I should call the worship team up and they're just going to stand here for a while because I have a lot more preaching to do, but... (laughs) Go ahead, come on up. It'll make me move faster. <laughs> Write this down. As spirit filled, this is a long one. Write this down. It's a long one. As spirit filled believers, we have an obligation to live according to the spirit. As spirit filled believers, we have an obligation to live according to the spirit. Let's keep moving in the text. Therefore, Brothers and sisters, as believers, we have an obligation. But it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Now hold on for a second. A couple things you need to understand. Paul sometimes just seems to like end a thought and move on. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. You would think the next verse would be, 
we have an obligation. It is to the spirit and to live according to it. Right. It's clearly assumed. It's clearly what he's talking about, but he doesn't say it. He says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. This almost sounds like once you put the misdeeds of the body to death, then you have life. And it almost sounds like you have to work through something. You have to kill some stuff before you're given life. And that's not what Paul's saying. He says, by the spirit, you already have to have the spirit in you to be able to put the misdeeds to death in the first place. You already have life in you. Now live that life. Live the life. Walk it out. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Again, read Colossians 3. He talks a lot about putting things to death. Galatians 5 says this, verse 24 and 25. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Put it to death. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. I love that idea. Just the way that sounds. Since we live by the Spirit, stay in step with the Spirit. Stay in step with the Spirit? Like the Spirit has a pace? That I would identify and understand that, that I'm not to go my own way, do my own thing, but to stay in step with the Spirit. It's hard for me not to think of it like a three-legged race. <laughs> my wife and I are about the same height. Uh, she's like 5'10", so we kill at the three-legged race. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> Love you, babe. But there's this idea of the reason that it works well is because we are in sequence with each other. That to be led by the Spirit is, is to stay in step with the Spirit. And too often, we make led by the Spirit to, to be only or primarily about, like, God, what's the next thing you want me to do? Like, what job? Who's my spouse? Where do I move? And I'm not saying that you shouldn't go to God with that. You should. But too often, we forget, like, the primary duties of the Spirit and teaching us in truth and pointing us towards Jesus and sanctifying us, the will of God that we would be sanctified. And that staying in step with the Spirit is, is walking in the Spirit. It is denying and killing off the flesh and following after God and obeying His commands. All people are made in God's image, but not all people are God's children. Wow. Believers. We are God's children. That's a controversial statement. I'm okay. The reason it's controversial is because that is the way that people view God in our culture. Because nobody wants to talk about the fact that there is real heaven and real hell. That there's real judgment, real wrath. And so they make these blanket statements by like, everybody's a child of God, which the Bible doesn't say. Now, every human is an image bearer. And so they have value. And so I'm not trying to like bring people down in their sense of value as image bearers of God. Human life is valuable. but I need you to understand there's a difference between just being born and being born again. Amen. There's a difference between being an image bearer because you come in the line of Adam who is in the image of God and being a child of God adopted through Christ Jesus. Yeah. The text would say, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Can we go to that 1 John verse real quick? 1 John 4, 18 says this. There is no fear in love, 
but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Now, can you go back to that Romans verse? The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Now, there is the idea of no longer a slave to sin, but a slave to righteousness in the sense that it is in charge and in control. And Paul even explains, I'm giving a a, a human argument so that you kind of understand this. But what it's saying here is that too many of us fear God because we only understand him as master and haven't quite understood yet that we have been adopted as children. And so we come before God and we see his commands and we see his rules and we still feel like there's something that we need to earn and that we're going to be condemned. If you're in Christ Jesus, there is no longer condemnation for you. There is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. You don't look forward to some sort of maybe punishment. So if I mess up tomorrow, everything's out the door. You have been adopted into the family. And it doesn't mean there's not still consequences for sin. Like if you go speed today and they give you a ticket, you can't be like, well, God forgave me. You should too. Like that's not how it works. (laughs) But what you can be sure of is even though you got the ticket, it doesn't change the fact that you go to heaven. And so there's this understanding as a child that comes to their father, longs to see their father smile and say, I'm proud of you, I love you, well done, that you go and you want to do God's commands because you trust that he loves you as your father and has given you commands that are best for you because of his great love for you, that he did all the work, he made the sacrifice, he made the way, he put you back in right standing, he adopted you. Kids don't choose their family and say, I'm adopting you as my family. The father adopts the children. And there is this understanding in this culture at the time where if you were adopting someone into your family, they took on the inheritance. Like you, they became a part of the family for real. I need you to understand this because some of you are still walking around waiting for God to get you. Every time you sin and you have forgotten that you are no longer under condemnation. You have a wrong idea. Maybe you understand him as father, but you have a wrong grasp on what father even means because you've seen it through a worldly view. And so you can see it as maybe abusive or coming to get you or always looking to discipline and never looking to love. And you need to understand it in the context of how the Bible says it. This is how we know what love is. That God moved. That God cares. That God made a way. Some of you need to just be set free because you live in fear. Which means you don't quite yet understand the love. The love has not quite been made complete in you because you still are walking around in fear. And I don't mean that you don't have this healthy fear of God because he's massive and above everything. But what I'm saying is you don't fear him like he's going to punish you or condemn you, but you understand him as your father. And you don't come arrogantly before him, but confidently knowing that he enjoys spending time with you. In fact, he enjoys it so much that Jesus died so you could do it. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Maybe you've heard it understood before. This is, this is an intimate call to Father. And, and nowhere before Jesus is on the scene do they look to God as Father. Jesus comes as the son and the heir and says, you'll be co-heirs with me. And when you pray, say, our father. It's a statement of intimacy and relationship and closeness and care and love far beyond a distant, foreign God. That all those that put their faith in Jesus have become children of God, brought into the fold, adopted into sonship. No longer to be afraid of condemnation and walk around like if I mess up. The, 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 this, it, it's not that today there's no condemnation, but tomorrow, 
It's been dealt with. There is no judgment for you in the future. It's been dealt with by Jesus on the cross. You are a child of the Most High God. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. It's the sense of... Some have said it's like saying daddy in our, com- in our current culture. And I'm scared to say that because too flippantly I've heard people go and, and pray to God in like a flippant way. Right. Daddy instead of an intimate father. F- father. So we look around sometimes and we forget. We see things that happen to us and we forget. And we, can, we, we can start to... This is, this is hard. We think of God doing stuff to us in a, in a cruel way. Or we, we've missed it. We totally missed it. We totally don't understand in that moment who our father is. Does he discipline? Yes. But more loving and nurturing than you could ever grasp. Yeah. And for our ultimate good. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. I have several verses I want to explain that with, but I'll do it next week. Because next week's going to talk about suffering and glory to get us started. Um, But I need us to understand that it's saying as children of God, actually walk it out that a child would look like their father, that they would follow in his footsteps, that they would, they, they would look to him to, for truth, that they would look to him for alignment, that they would look to him for understanding, that we would trust in God. I pray that, that something in the text today God used to just grab onto you whether it be that that you have the Spirit living inside of you because you belong to Christ and you just needed to hear that again, whether it be an understanding of He made me righteous to actually live righteous and has empowered me to do so by the same Spirit He brought me to life with, I'm to live by, Or maybe you just need to understand because you've been walking in fear as a slave instead of understanding what it means to have God as your father. And you need to breathe a sigh of relief and receive the love that's extended to you in Jesus Christ. Can you stand to your feet?